feel like I should have planned one more song there. Yeah, kind of like <laughs> that one's so quick. Yeah. All right. So back in Philippians chapter one, once again, it's only four pages long. So I wanted to give you plenty of time to find it. <laughs> Paul here is talking to a church. We read Thessalonians a while back and Paul was talking to a church that was doing everything right. And he just had so much praise for the Thessalonians. And here we see a very similar situation with the Philippians. He says in verse 15, some to be sure are preaching Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do so from love because they know that I am pleased here for the defense of the gospel. The former pro proclaim Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, because they think they can cause trouble for me in my imprisonment. What is the result? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is being proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. So this is a very strange passage to read. It helps to have a little bit of background. Paul is is writing to the Philippians from prison. And his opponents, those who are arguing for a very different idea of Christianity than what Paul has been preaching, think of this as an opportunity. Because in his day, there were two groups of Christians. There were those who said, all Christians have to be circumcised in order to become Jewish. So whether you're Greek or Gentile, it doesn't matter. You have to be circumcised. You have to become Jewish. Paul said that Jesus came to save people of all the nations, not just the Jews in Israel, not just the Jews spread across the world, but every nation. And if we were all circumcised, well, then there would only be one nation, wouldn't there? It would be Israel. And then Christ's work would never be done. So Paul preached that the Gentiles should not be circumcised. And while he's in prison, his opponents are taking it as an opportunity to go to the churches he's planted and say, you know that Paul guy? He doesn't quite have things right. This is what you really need to do. And Paul's saying to the Philippians, good on you. You didn't fall for it. <laughs> Isn't that this? And we know today in churches, there's always some who make trouble. Well, isn't it comforting to know it was the same in Paul's day? Some things never change. But he says to the Philippians, what is the result? What is the result of all their troublemaking? Christ is proclaimed. It doesn't matter if we get it right. It doesn't matter if I stand up here and preach the truth or if I'm just dead wrong. If I've read this and just gotten it completely wrong because Christ is being proclaimed and the spirit is moving through our community and through the spirit, the truth will be heard. Not because I'm such a good preacher, but because the spirit is the spirit of truth. In chapter 2, verse 6, he goes on. He says, you, I clipped this in such a way that I cut the sentence in half. <laughs> so excuse me a moment. Ah, yes. In verse 5, he said, you should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. And then he gives us a poem who thought he existed in the form of God, excuse me, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men and by sharing in human nature. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, a torturous death. As a result, God 
highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He gives us the greatest example to live by. Christ came to earth as God among us, as Emmanuel. And yet, he gave up all of that privilege of being God to live among us, to serve us. Paul goes on in chapter 3 to establish that he is living in the same example and that we should too. In verse 7, he says, but these assets I have come to regard as liabilities. He's gone on in the verses before this, talking about all his credentials as a Pharisee, as a teacher of the law, as someone who was advanced among his peers. This is like someone with a PhD, say, going out and becoming a fry cook. That's what Paul is doing. And he flaunts his credentials. And then he says, but these assets I have come to regard as liabilities. Think about that for a moment. Paul knows what he's talking about. He knows the scripture cover to cover. He has preached the scripture. He has killed people for not following what he thought was in the scripture. And that is a liability to him because he has a great deal of education and a great deal of dedication. But think for a moment of the example of Peter. Peter was a fisherman. When he started preaching after Christ had risen and ascended to heaven, when he preached in Jerusalem, the teachers of the law questioned him in the book of Acts and said, how are you, how is he saying these things? He's a fisherman, and you can tell by the way he talks. Because Peter was coarse. Peter was uneducated. Peter, by tradition, was considered to be likely in his 50s when he started preaching. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. And that's how people knew that what he was saying came from God. Because he had none of the assets that Paul had. We don't have... Peter's message, by the way. We only know about it through Paul because Peter never wrote anything down. He couldn't write anything down. Even the works of first through first and second Peter are thought to have been written by his disciples, not by Peter himself, because he couldn't write. Paul says that all that he has achieved in the world are liabilities because of Christ. More than that, I now regard all things as liabilities compared to the far greater value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Indeed, I, I regard them as worthless. When Jesus said, it is easier for a rich man to enter the it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. This is exactly what he was talking about. He was talking about Paul giving up all of his privilege, all of his wealth, all of his goals in this life in order to for further the goal of the kingdom, in order to rededicate his life to Christ. And he had to say, of everything. Indeed, I regard it as worthless. Why? Because he was going to travel the world and he couldn't take it with him. <laughs> regard them as worthless that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not because I have my own righteousness derived from the law. After all, that's why he had killed people but because I have the righteousness that comes by way of Christ's faithfulness, a righteousness from God that is in fact based on Christ's faithfulness. If any one of us is righteous, it's not by the works that we have done. 
even though we can do righteous things, we can do good works in the world, but we are not justified by those good works. We're justified by what Christ has done before us because now every good thing that we do is because Christ has gone before us. He has prepared the way for us. So what credit can we really take? Before there was Christianity, there were a number of religions and not one of them preached that God is love. Think about the Greek religion for a while. Think about Zeus. That is the epitome of God is love to the Greeks. And oh, how Zeus spread that love around. But he was never faithful to his wife. He was never a good man. But that was what Greek men thought was the epitome of what a man should be, of what a husband should be. And when they looked to Hera and how she was always faithful, how she always served her husband, they, Greek women looked to that as their ideal of being a perfect wife, a perfect mother. But not one of them thought that God is love. When we look to the religions of the world, we never see this message until Christ. And then over the next few hundred years, every religion starts to preach that God is love. We see it in every corner of the earth. Nowhere in the world can we say that we believed God was love before Christ told us it was so, before Christ died to show us that it was so. This is why Paul continues, my aim is to know him, to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings and to be like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul sees what has been promised throughout the scripture, the resurrection of the dead, as now being fulfilled through Christ. And that doesn't necessarily mean that he sees this promise as only through Christ, but he sees it as Christ fulfilling the promise. I don't know if that's clear how I'm phrasing it, but... Repeat it again. That he sees the resurrection of the dead as coming through Christ that Christ fulfills the promise and that through him, we share in the resurrection. Now, there are those that argue that you have to know Christ, that you have to accept Christ to attain the resurrection. But what's important here is that the re resurrection comes through Christ. And I think that those are two very different things. So Paul is imitating Christ. He gives Christ as the example. Paul says he has given up his wealth, he has given up his privilege, and he has done so in the example of Christ, who was God himself, and has given that up to become human, and more than just human, but a servant to all of us. That is the example that Paul is exhorting the Philippians to live because he's not seeing it in the churches that are spreading their message to the, to the churches Paul has planted, to the churches, to these other churches that are saying that you need to obey the whole law. You need to be completely moral. We're not justified by our morals. We're justified by faith. We can never be moral enough. We can never be good enough. We will always be seeking a higher standard. We will be always seeking for perfection that can only be found in Christ. And that is the gospel. That is the message that these other churches are lacking. They're saying you have to live by the letter of the law. Like when it says in Leviticus, do not eat shellfish. Well, do you eat shrimp? 
We can never conform to every letter of the law anyways, because there are over 613 commandments. And out of those, only 193 are even applicable without the temple being built in Israel. And without a nation and without being in the nation of Israel, you can only uphold 111. And of those, none were actually given to the church because Christ told us that we are to live by love and that by love, there is no, there is no law higher uh, that places a higher standard upon us than love. I know there are many churches that start when they preach the gospel with the bad news. By the way, do you know that we're going to hell? It's bad news, right? We're all going to hell. And that's why we need Jesus. Well, I'm not an infernalist and I don't preach about hell. Because Christ told us to spread the good news. Paul then says in chapter four, so then my brothers and sisters, dear friends whom I long to see my joy and crown stand in the Lord in this way, my dear friends. You see, Paul doesn't preach about hell either. In all of the Bible, there is no hell mentioned. We get this from Dante's Inferno. It doesn't come from the Bible. That means every preacher in the first century never said a word about hell. But that's really hard to believe. I mean. And yet it's so essential to understanding what the gospel is, because in the gospel, there is no hell. So when we preach the word of God, we preach a message of love. We preach a message of salvation. And so I want to leave you with these words from Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 8. Paul tells us exactly what we should be talking about, exactly what we should be looking for in the world and who we should be. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if something is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. And what you learned and, rece and received and heard and saw in me, do these things. And the God of peace will be with you. So as we go out into the world, as we live our lives, let's look for these things. And let's cherish those things where we find them, because they're from God. When we see the beauty of nature, when we see the beauty in one another, the, the good, the righteousness that God has placed in each and everyone's hearts, when we see these things, let's rejoice in them, because God has placed them there. Finally, will you go with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for bringing us together, for giving us good news that you are a God who loves, a God who saves, a God who creates wonders and places them all over this world, Lord. Lord, we pray that we find those wonders you have placed in our own hearts that we learn to see the good in others, Lord, that we learn to find the good in this world and that we always cherish it, that we always fight for it, Lord, that we never give up spreading your good news and that, Lord, we never cease to be your children that we are always seeking to be more perfect, to be more like you. In your son's name, amen. <clears throat>